God is in this house if it's in a living room, and God is in this right. house if it's a mega church. In the New Testament, it says that our bodies are a temple. Right. So God is in this house means mm -hmm. in my body. When I'm singing that, the Holy Spirit's in my body. So mm -hmm. we can let fear give way to freedom. Between the Grooves is hosted by James Curtis, music director and morning man in the greater Toronto area on Joy Radio. And Aisha Woods, Grammy-nominated singer, songwriter, and musician. Together, they talk with artists and industry insiders to discover our connection between music and faith. You can connect with us on Facebook or Twitter at Between Grooves. Now, here's James and Aisha. Well, here we are. I'm uh, happy to say, Aisha, you know, the last time we got together, I was coffee-less. Mm, and, and I was, got your coffee today. Huh? And I was trying my darndest to, to be awake and alert, and obviously I was not. <laughs> but today, look, look what I've got. I've got a coffee Check in my hand. Check you out. Oh, yeah. You're, you're sporty. Yep, as, well. As my grandma used to say, sporty. I'm, I'm treating myself, <laughs> yes. Well, i got to treat myself every time for Between the Grooves. But uh, anyways, <laughs> listen, uh, today we, we kind of didn't know what was going to happen. Um, yeah. We did not have a guest booked, and uh, things just happened. And hmm. I'm so glad they did. Um, yeah, you and I both. Can I tell you, this conversation with Jesse Reeves from King's Porch, uh, it blew me away. Hmm. It will blow you away as well, I think. It, it was just one of these conversations that just uh, is unexpected yes. and yet mind-blowing and... Uh, kind of thinking outside of the box, you know what I mean? Like we all have this perception mm -hmm. of the way things should be, and I'm not going to oh, yeah. get into too many details because Jesse uh, is just brilliant in the way he describes some of the stuff that he's been working on and that he's been involved in. But you know, we have this perception of the way things should be, and sometimes sure. you need somebody like Jesse to kind of, you know, pull the walls away a little bit and say, right. "What about this? What about this?" Yeah, right. ask some right. questions. You know, look at things from a diff different perspective. So, that's sure. kind of what we're doing today, and I'm and I'm really glad we we have this opportunity with Jesse yeah. Reeves from King's Porch. Hello, can you hear me? I can. Can awesome. you hear me? Uh, we can hear you great, <laughs> uh, Jesse. Um, I guess you were recently in London. I was. I was. I, I saw some uh, pictures on your uh, IG. Uh, did you bring your kids? Like, did you bring your sons with you? Or no? So I have four kids. Um, All right, that's a good it's, number. Uh, so ten years ago, I was watching some interview with Gwyneth Paltrow and her dad, Bruce Paltrow, and Bruce was talking about when he took Gwyneth to uh, Paris before her senior year in high school. And they sat by the Eiffel Tower, and he told her that every girl's first trip to Paris should be with the man that's going to love her for the rest of it, of her life. Oh, wow. And I looked at my wife, and I said, I'm going to do that with our girls. And so my oldest daughter is 23, and so before her senior year, I mean, that was five years ago, I took her. And then my second daughter, Rachel, her senior year was actually two years ago, but covid was going on so we couldn't do it so now she's a sophomore at Baylor but I finally got to take her and we went to London and Paris and Bruges and nice. just got to sit there and you know tell her that her first trip had to be with the man that's going to love her for the rest of her life and she cried and I hugged <laughs> her and every everything was worth it it was all worth oh, it kind of puts pressure yeah. on all the dads out there though <laughs> well you know what I mean Bruce Bruce Paltrow put pressure on me and never knew it but it's true <laughs> is so worth it mm -hmm. that's true that'd be a that'd be a great trip so you mm -hmm. um uh, i'm when i saw the songs that you've co-written um well first of all it was like wow and then secondly was you must be doing okay <laughs> um but i i just love these songs like thank you i mean they, they've beautiful songs. they've went they've gone around the world how great is our god our god i will rise indescribable lord i need you like these are big big songs um mm -hmm. yeah i'm just blown away by it it's i mean 
I, I really can't say anything other than God has just been really generous and really kind. Um, I literally never thought I would be a songwriter, and wow. now that's what I do for a living. <laughs> so that's nice. You're what were you going to be? Oh man, that's a long story. Uh, <laughs> I I was raised on a ranch in Texas. Like for anybody that I live in Austin now, but when the stereotypical like that guy's from Texas, he was probably raised on a ranch and riding horses mm-hmm. and cows. I, I go, yeah, that was that was me. My dad is still a rancher. Uh, wow, he was he's been the head of three different beef breeds. Um, so that's how I was raised, and he was also in Vietnam, and so I was raised obsessed with the Air Force, and all mm. I wanted to do my whole childhood was fly F sixteens. Um, <laughs> I used to put together model airplanes, and I had my hair cut like Oliver North, and. That's just what I wanted to do. And then you kind of date yourself when you say Oliver North, by the yeah. way. Like, I know what you're talking about, but the younger generation wouldn't have a clue. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Justine, Justine our producer, is in the other studio and she's looking at me. Think, well, I, don't, I don't have. I, who's Oliver North? <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's I'll, funny. Save you the, I'll save you the math. I'm 47. So I'm, that means I was a child of the original Top Gun, you know? So uh, that's, that's all I'm. I, <laughs> That's all I wanted to do. And then when I when I went through puberty, I went from five seven to six four in one summer. Wow. And, oh my gosh. And the true story, the cutoff to fly F sixteens is six one. So I I no kidding. grew I literally grew too much. I was too tall. And I was kind of <laughs> crushed and didn't know what I wanted to do with my life and and then you know I, it's funny to one thing led to another in this instance, but literally one thing led to another. I started playing music, grew my hair out, you know, mm. got my, got my ears pierced. My dad was really concerned about me. And, <laughs> uh, but I, I met Jesus when I was 15, uh, September 23rd mm. of 1990 and my whole life changed. And I just, I just remember praying Jesus, whatever you want me to do. The answer is yes. I didn't pray I want to be a musician. I didn't pray I want to be a songwriter. I just said, whatever right. you want me to do, the answer is yes. And he said, okay, that's what I need. So hmm. and here did, I am. How did you get hooked up with Chris Tomlin? Well, so when I was in high school, I was in a band. Uh, we were called Judah when I was uh, when I was All 15 right. out of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And, you know, we we sold dozens and dozens of records over. Dozen, dozens, not hundreds, not no, thousands, no, no. not millions, dozens. Yeah, <laughs> so, and I'm not, dozens, yeah. but it was more than twelve. So yeah, right. more than more than twenty four technically. Yeah, but but I'm not bragging. That was over like an eight year period. So <laughs> eight years, <laughs> <laughs> and, and but, it was your mom that bought them all. I know. Yeah, yeah. Well, aunts and uncles. But, That's right. Uh, no, we we literally we signed a we signed a record contract when I was you know, in high school and started going to Nashville and making records and changed our name to between thieves is uh, what we were back in. That is a cool name, actually. Wow. It was a cool name. That's a great name. um, You know, we, we did touring as much as we could in high school and college. And I got out of that band when I graduated from college and this was like, I've got to do something else with my life, you know? And, um, in August, I got a call from this country boy in Grand Saline, Texas named Chris Tomlin. And <laughs> he asked, he asked me if I would play bass for him. I was like, nah, man, I can't like, I just got married. I got to grow up. And he literally said, I asked me if I would play one time. He needed somebody that weekend at a, at a event in Texas called hot hearts. If anybody's ever heard Hot of that. Hot hearts. Hot hearts. Yeah, it's like, you know, one of those true love weights rallies or whatever. So Oh, okay. Um I said yes. So I went and I played for him one time and it was like What's I, turned I did, into I did, <laughs> Well, I didn't know what worship music was. I was raised yeah. I was raised with like a, a music minister, you know, the guy that stands up in front with the does his hands up and down yes. and and hymns. And I didn't know what worship music was. I mean, again, wow. you have to remember this is 1997. There, sure. there really wasn't worship music. And so um, 
I played for Chris and it was like when, you know, the first night when we played worship music, I was like, it was like God said, this is what I've been training you for and this is what you were mm. created for. So when I told him yes for one time and it ended up being 17 years. So, <laughs> um, and again, you know, we, we, we just, Chris worked at a church. I taught elementary school. I taught second grade for two years and third grade for two years. No we would kidding. play on the weekends and we just wanted to write songs for church. Um, yes. It wasn't, it never started out that we wanted to be a band. So when we were writing songs, we were writing for church and we would play summer camps. You know, we hmm. would do like 13 summer camps in a row. And literally, you know, we wrote the first song I wrote with him in probably 97, 98 was a song called Kindness. Um, mm. We wrote that at Falls Creek in Oklahoma and loved the song. And so we started writing together. And then literally in, in 2000, we wrote How Great Is Our God for a summer camp and mm. never, ever had a clue what God was going to do with that song. So <laughs> I, I always tell people that, you know, we wrote that in 2000 and I spent the next 14 years with Chris just chasing that song around the world. My goodness. So you've led worship. You have toured a lot, obviously, over the years, but you're also a church planter. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, my wife and I are what you would call slow learners. <laughs> so uh, I'm in that same boat. I'm in that same Listen, boat. Yeah. You, I, I, I think your wife's going to have something to say about you calling her a slow learner. <laughs> oh, she would. No, she would agree. I don't know if you've ever planted a church, but whenever you plant a church, you say, like, I will never, ever, ever do that again. <laughs> and uh, we, we've said that three times. So um, in 2000, wow. uh, we moved to Austin when I was still with Chris, and we all moved to Austin together and started a church here in Austin called the Austin Stone. And, okay. um, but, you know, that started in our living room. And, you know, now it's got five or six campuses and thousands of members, you know, in it's just, you know, you're, you're by definition, mega church. And mm -hmm. then in two, in 2008, no. Yeah. 2008, we all moved to Atlanta, Georgia to help start passion city church. Okay. Um, and then in 2014 is when I pulled the rip cord on everything and just, you know, I, I moved back to Texas, moved back to Austin. Um, didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up and uh, I'm, I'm there too. I'm still there. Yeah. yeah. Literally said, yeah. said I would never, we would never do that again. And I went, I went to, I actually went to work when I quit playing for Chris and got off the road. I went to work at the Austin stone, which was weird okay. since it started in our living room. And it was kind of a whole right. different regime of people too. So I was, I was working for people at a church that we started. I don't know. It was weird. It was an exercise <laughs> yeah. in humility, to say the least. Um, wow. But my wife, yeah, I mean, y'all really should just interview her. She's a better human than me, but she she <laughs> is super dialed in. She's, she prays like crazy. God talks to her, you know, and she came to me in 2017 mm -hmm. and she said, Jesus told me something this morning and you're not going to like it. Oh, no. Oh, my. And oh I was my. like, I know. Right. And I was like, uh, mm -hmm. OK. And and I've been married to her long enough to know if she said Jesus told her something. Yes. It's because Jesus told her something. <laughs> like, sure, I, don't sure. even, I don't even question it anymore. So I, I said, <laughs> OK, what did he say? And she said, uh, he told me that you have to quit going to church for one year. And I was like, mm. I was like, what? Like that, that, that doesn't make sense. And she goes, no, he did. And he told me that you have been paid to be a Christian since you were 15 years old. And My it's going to take, it's going to take you a year to figure out who Jesus is again. Wow. Oh my. And so I did. Yo, I, I, my last day at the Austin stone was December 1st of 2017. And, uh, we, I quit going to church and we just, 
started reading the Bible together, um, reading Acts together. Mm, you know, mm. Acts two forty two says those that yes, were sir. of the way devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, the teaching of the apostles, and to prayer. And my wife was like, "Why can't this be church?" Mm, and I was like, "I'm preaching I, now." I, yeah, right. <laughs> so, so we we started just meeting uh, in a friend of ours home on Sunday nights and we would eat dinner together and we would read the Bible together and discuss it. And then we would just pray for each other every week and mm. started going, man, this, this feels right. You know, five of the epistles, when you read them, it says to the church in the house of so-and-so. So like for the first yes. 300 years, they were all house churches. And, and let me just mm-hmm. pause right here and say, I, I'm not like the house church guy. Like this is the only way to do church because obviously we've right, started right. two other mega churches but right now in this season i really feel like this is what we're called to do so mm. um we started meeting we're like okay this was in this year off of you know just trying to figure out who jesus is again and reading the bible and going okay well why don't we do that first corinthians 14 says when you gather together, brothers, everyone should bring a word, a teaching, a prophecy, a song, or a yes. song. Yes, yes. And, and, but we don't do that, right? It mm-hmm. says it in the Bible, we don't do that. We come and we sit in the <laughs> dark room and we listen to one guy talk about the passage and we listen to one worship leader instead of come everybody. Come on, preach. Come on, preach. <laughs> everybody You're that's right on. The, you are right on right now. There's right? so much yes, I can yes. say, but you know. <laughs> yeah, so. So anyway, we started doing this and and we're like, man, this feels like church. Like, what if this is what church looked like? And what if instead of growing bigger, you just multiplied? So as soon as the Mm -hmm. house gets too big, you raise up leaders and you multiply to another house. And and then I and then I asked the question, like, well, what if what if it was legally a church and people could give money to it? But we gave all the money away and nobody got paid. Like, is that even Mm -hmm. legal? So I started asking questions. And a friend of mine goes, well, I mean, this is what Francis Chan is doing in in San Francisco. And Mm -hmm. I was like, really? So, you know, I I used to do like, you know, I've been on world tours with Francis, but I hadn't talked to him in five years. So long story short, I call Francis. I just vomited everything I just told you in like three minutes. (laughs) And he said, well, why don't you and Janet move to San Francisco? and and just help us at we are church and i was like Hmm. because that actually would be easier than what i feel like god's asking us to do um Mm. i feel like he's asking us to do this in our city in austin so um we went out to san francisco stayed with him lisa for like four days and just asked them like what they've done right what they've done wrong how do you multiply sure and came back and we've been doing it now for four years um we currently have seven houses um about to open eight and nine hopefully and that's it's i can't i, I can't go back to be honest with you it i hear it's, you uh, it's scary um and hmm. it's messy when you can't hide and <laughs> when you when you come in the door and you've been fighting with your wife everybody knows it but mm-hmm. guess what? Everybody gets to pray for you. And sure enough, and, you know, especially with with men, you know, we break up and pray for each other. And at first, you know, men are like men, men are men. They don't want to open up. So they're <laughs> like, you know, pray, pray for my job, you know, pray that I whatever. But then after you get to know each other, men start saying, you know, like, you know, pray for my relationship with my kids. You know, mm-hmm. you know, and, mm-hmm. and and you start praying for real things and see God start answering real things. And it's it's just been amazing. So anyway, that's a really long story. But now we're wow, it's wonderful. just mul- multiplying house churches and our motto is grow smaller. We just want to keep getting smaller and I more love houses. It. And wow. if you. You know, if you multiply one time a year on year 11, you'll have 1,024 churches. So the scary thing to us right now is it's working. So who knows? So interestingly enough, uh, I mean, I'm just going to keep talking. Y'all can just cut me off. (laughs) No, no. It's wonderful. It's necessary. 
interestingly enough is, uh, you know, after we eat a meal together, then when we start our meeting, we start every every time with Jesus stories, um, which is is like, you know, I'll just go around the room and say, hey, let's go around the room right now and and just tell of one time this week that you got to speak the name of Jesus to somebody. Hmm. And y'all, the first three or four months of that was the most painfully awkward thing you've ever sat through in your entire life. Wow. Hmm. And I would, I would just let it be awkward, you know, right. just like long silences. No, you know, some just, just, just tell us one time this week that you spoke the name of Jesus, hmm. and and nobody could do it because nobody wow. speaks the name of Jesus, you know, and and so just trying to encourage people to speak the name of Jesus, like when you when you read the New Testament, it says uh, it says thousands were coming to know him daily. That's and right. then you you fast forward to 2023 and we have the fewest amount of people coming to know Christ. And mm-hmm. you just have to ask the question, what are we Why? doing wrong? You know, we Why? have more we have more money. We have more resources. We have more Christian sure. music for crying out loud. I'm preaching to the choir. Right. That's what I do. Mm-hmm. But that's not bringing people to Jesus. So. Right. So what happened? And I truly believe it's because people have stopped seeing themselves as priests. You know, Mm. uh, Peter said, you know, you, speaking to believers, are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a a people of God's own choosing, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Yeah. In the first 300 years, people understood that they were priests. So, you know, Mm. if you're a blacksmith you're a priest or if you're a farmer, you're a priest and, and you're the one that's representing God to people and representing people to God. And, and they were doing that. And then, sorry, I, I'm, I get fired up about this, but that happened for 300, that, that (laughs) happened for 300 years. And then in 313, when Constantine signed the edict of Milan and, and he made a separation between clergy and lay people, And they're starting Mm -hmm. being professional Christians. And so from that point to today, there's been this steady decline. And I think it's the plan of the enemy for people to not see themselves as priests. And they they just want to come sit in a room and listen to a guy and go home and do nothing. And that is Mm. not that's not a threat to the enemy. And so we're just trying to get people like. So asking every week, have you spoken the name of Jesus? Have you spoken the name of Jesus? Have you spoken the name of Jesus? And ended up writing a little song called I Speak Jesus that was literally (laughs) literally trying to get our people to speak the name of Jesus. Hmm, Deployment. (laughs) Yeah. Right. And and again, it's it's kind of like I'm 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 not saying it's you know, the same category is how great is our God, but it's how great is our God for me 2.0. And it's a song that was never meant to go around the world. It was meant to get our people to speak the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And, and it's almost like God goes, yeah, I like that. And then he just kind of blows on (laughs) it, you know, and then it it goes. And now like every, every day I get, videos of someone around the world singing that song and i'm just like it just blows my mind how god (laughs) uses songs like that do you find in north america a lot of people play church you know it's it's kind of like a club that you know you go on a sunday Mm. and then after then then you go on with your yeah yeah, it's like a social get together to the point where i would even say that at times it seems like Boy, I'm gonna I'm gonna get into hot water for this. I'm gonna oh boy, we're gonna get some people complaining. I've about probably the show. already got us in there, so you're good. Uh, you yeah, know, I, I, <laughs> right? I would say that uh, would it be fair to say that there are many in North America? There are many Pharisees. Oh sure, uh, yes, for sure. Many, like many, yeah. many, <laughs> like too many. Just but you know what? Just it's really like religious. Yeah. True. And but you know what? That's not pointing the finger because I can be one. Sure. So sure. E- Every so time. easily. And so, yeah, it's I, I really I really think that it's a plan from the enemy. And, you know, he's so crafty and he's so good at what he does. 
he he's not trying to make you hate God. He's just trying to make you ineffective. Mm-hmm. So if mm-hmm. if you if he can if he can make it where your idea of church is you go sit in a dark room and listen to somebody and go home and do nothing, it doesn't threaten him. So that's why you know people ask all the time, well, why isn't Satan attacking the 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 American church like he attacks you know the church in Iran or the church in China? And my answer to that is because he doesn't have to. We're we're not a threat to him. And so, you know, I don't know. That's we're just trying we're just trying to get people to elevate their priesthood and go out and talk and speak about, about Jesus. And what's crazy is now four years into it, we we almost have to cut Jesus stories off every week because <laughs> people are people are doing it. And also, I mean, I talked about the the money aspect, but now somebody can come during Jesus story time and say, Hey, I met, I met a single mom at the grocery store that can't pay rent this, this month. Yeah. Do you think that we could use our money to pay her rent? So every time what we'll do is we'll say, yes, find out how much her, her rent is, you know, her rent may be 1300 bucks or whatever. What I'll say is I'm not going to give her $1,300. I'm going to give you $1,300 and you're going to elevate your priesthood you're going to go sit down with her, pay her mortgage, but I want you to look her in the eyes and tell her that Jesus loves her, that he sees her, and he hadn't forgotten about her. Yeah. Well, when they do that and they elevate their priesthood, you know who's going to show up at your house next week? <laughs> that woman. She is. Yeah, you, you know, know we, have, we have people that, you know, the husband's been in jail, and, and then he gets out, and actually some of our shepherds, when they first started coming, the husband had just gotten out of jail and Jesus has mm. saved their marriage and changed them. And we discipled them. And now they're shepherding one of our houses. It's just See? the gospel. So, yeah. So propagation. Eh? So King's porch, talk about it. King's porch is there is no physical building. There is no physical building. The, these There's, are all living rooms. Right. So King's porch uh, in this year off when Janet and I were reading acts together, it mentions it twice in Acts and once in Luke, I think. Um, it was called Solomon's Portico. Um, it's mm-hmm. in Acts, Acts chapter 3, uh, the first time he, uh, Peter healed the guy that was, it says he was lame from birth. And, yeah. and, you know, it's the famous silver and gold, have I none, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Of Nazareth, Shut up! Up and walk. Um, <laughs> that happened on Solomon's Portico. And so Janet, my wife, was like, what is Solomon's portico? This is where all this crazy stuff starts happening. You know, they start dragging their sick into the street so that when Peter walks Mm -hmm. by, his shadow falls on them and they get healed. Like all of this was happening literally right outside the doors of the temple, which is crazy because these guys in Acts 3, it says it was the ninth hour. They were going to the temple for prayer. But all these guys are following Jesus now. And so they they can't go into the temple because of what they're preaching is heresy. But they still want to get together in community. So they start gathering together outside the doors of the temple. And this is where the Holy Spirit starts doing crazy things. Right. And so that's our goal is something outside the walls of the normal temple with a bunch of people who really love Jesus and believe that the Holy Spirit still wants to move in power. And yeah. that's what we're asking for. So, yeah, that's why we call it King's Porch, because it's it's named after Solomon's portico. That's wonderful. But it, it's making me excited. I, I, when you were sharing about um, how you all give and meet the needs of those that are in a place, like in a tough position, um, I'm reminded of the same the way that they did it in the book of Acts. Yes. And he said, no man had too much, no man had too little, but they shared and now they had all things in common. And it's just the Bible way. You're right. It's it exciting. says there, there was no need among them. Right. And so, yeah, I, I'm with you. It's it's so exciting to be able to, to be the church and take care of the needs of the people. Mm-hmm. And it's refreshing based on what we all have grown up 
knowing as the church, right? I mean, they, they always sure. say the church is not the building, it's the people. But at the end of the day, we've always gone to a building. And, sure. and even, you know, you describing how how King's Porch operates, we're used to, in North America, attending a building where there's, you know, a paid pastor on staff, and we sit in that room, you know, maybe participating in the praise and worship, and then there's a sermon, mm. and that's the only person that speaks, and then, you know, maybe an offering or something like that, if, the, if they still do that, but then the service is over and you go home, and that's church. Mm. Right. And that's, that's and not really... Is- Church, it's 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 a right. it's a club, right? Especially it's, it's during the pandemic, y'all. When during the pandemic, if I saw one more picture of somebody's feet by a computer screen, you know, like <laughs> oh, I love my church, and I was like, I just I just wanted to come through the through their computer screen and say, this is not church. <laughs> Your feet by a computer is not church. Um, and and can I just tell you one thing? Like, honestly, I've learned more in the last four years from from our kids than I've learned from adults in my life. I love that. Because yeah. we keep we keep kids in there with us. Right. It's families. Mm-hmm. And th- and we we read the passage and then we literally do it. I don't know if you're familiar with Discovery Bible study, but we ask three questions. What does this say about God? What does this say about man? And how should we change? And our mm. kids participate in that. Like, what does this tell you about God after you read a chapter in the Bible? And our kids just have like the most pure, innocent revelations from God. Uh, I, I, can I tell you one story? One. Yes. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> more than one. Sure. <laughs> this is, I mean, I literally could tell you a hundred of them, but I'll never forget um, in the first year we were doing this. Um, we, my, my daughter that I just took to, to London, she was 13, I think. And mm. we were studying the stoning of Stephen. I think that's like Acts mm. 7 or somewhere around there. And we, you know, had, we were discussing it. Everybody's been reading it all week. We're talking about it. And at the very end, we're, we're done. We're about to break up and pray. And I was like, does anybody have anything else they feel like the Holy Spirit's telling them to say to the group? And, Rachel, you know, 13 year old girl raises her hand. She goes, dad, can I say something? And I was like, sure, Rach, go for it. And she goes, uh, I don't think Steven knew he was about to die. Hmm. And I was like, okay, yeah, cool. Thank, thanks for sharing that, Rachel. You know, like, well, that was a weird thing to say. And, <laughs> and she kind of paused and she goes, dad, I don't think Steven wanted to die. And I was like, okay, like, you know, we've read this story so many times. You don't, you don't think about things like that. And I was like, okay, Rach, you're you're probably right. He probably didn't want to die. And she kind of paused for a second and she goes, it's almost like Stephen didn't know what God's plan was, but he knew what his purpose was. Hmm. 13 years old. Yeah. So the whole room gets real quiet. And she says, 13-year-old girl says to a room full of adults, she goes, I feel like what the Holy Spirit's trying to tell us right now is if you know what your purpose is in life, the plan doesn't matter. <laughs> and I started I started weeping. I'm sure. And lit- literally it has changed. That statement from a 13-year-old girl has changed my life. Cause I'm, I'm still a songwriter, right? So I go to, I go to Nashville once a month and I write a lot of worship songs, but I also write a lot of country songs. So Mm -hmm. I'll be walking into a country, right? And there, I know on the other side of this door is two guys I don't know. And we're going to try to write a country song and I will put my hand on the doorknob and I will hear my 13 year old daughter say, if you know what Hmm. your purpose is, the plan doesn't matter. And it shifts something in me to where now when I walk in that room, I don't know if we're going to write a song. I don't know if we if we do write a song, if that song's ever going to get cut or if it's ever going to get played. I don't know what right. the plan is, but I know my purpose walking in this door right now is to be a pastor to these two dudes. Sure, sure. And so 
it shifts my my purpose for walking in the room. So mm-hmm. if if the session's over and I can leave and and I've been able to be a priest and encourage them, speak the name of Jesus to them, maybe even pray pray for them, then that's that's the goal of that right. Yeah. And I can walk away and go, "Okay, that was successful. I don't know what's going to happen with the song. I don't know what the plan is, but I know what my purpose is for being in that room." Sure. Does that make sense? So Oh, it makes I, a lot of I, sense. I could I could give you literally fifty of those that have been spoken out of the mouths of kids that I'm like, hmm. that's the most profound thing I've ever heard in my life. It's because <laughs> they they if they follow Jesus, they have the same Holy Spirit we have. It's not a miniature right. version, There's you know. No and a lot of times, <laughs> right? A lot of times, it's it's even it's less filtered and it's less you know, put in a box than an adult. Sure. Well, adults tend to overthink things sometimes, right? Oh, for yeah, sure. for sure. I think that's why Jesus said, if you're going to come to me, you got to come as a child. If you're going to experience my kingdom, you, all of it has to be as a child because a child is, you know, blind faith. They have blind faith. They'll just believe if, if daddy says something, that's all that matters. It settles it, you know? If we can yeah. be more like kids when it comes to the things of God and his kingdom and his spirit, man, I, I think we'd see a, a real move. Yeah, I'm 100% amen to that. I, I so like the forum that you have with the the way your church operates because it's in, mm-hmm. a, it's in a living room environment. It's, it's a lot more relaxed. Um, mm-hmm. And because it's an opportunity for families to get together, you have the right. interaction with the younger generation that are going to be, you know, maybe igniting a fire because they've got perhaps a wisdom that that we never even thought they had, you know, hundred mm-hmm. percent. And I'll tell you another advantage that this was a this was something that was it's a it's more of a side effect because it was in no way in our you know, our vision, half the people at my house, I mean, every house is different, but half the people at my house right now are Catholic. (laughs) And we have one uh, Hispanic Catholic uh, family that comes to our house and the the whole family got saved on our back porch. It was like one of the Mm -hmm. most beautiful days. But in talking to them, um, I said, I said, would you have ever gone to the to the Austin Stone? You know, I told no I told you about that church earlier. And he yeah. goes, he goes, no way, man. And I said, why? Yeah. And he goes, he goes, because that's a Baptist church. <laughs> and I said, well, <laughs> what would you say if I told you that the Austin Stone started in our living room? And he was like, you're Baptist? <laughs> and I was like, bro, like, I, I'm a follower of Jesus. Yes, and, yes. And so one thing we're seeing is, you know, turns out the Bible says that there's one church and there's one Lord That's and there's right. one baptism mm-hmm. and there's one Holy Spirit. Right. When you when you meet in a living room, you can get rid of all of those labels. And sure. it, it, it doesn't matter if it's Catholic or Protestant or Jew or Gentile or Greek or free or slave. Yes. Like like Paul says that none of that matters anymore. Right, so right. it's just beautiful to see all those walls of religion coming down, and just the only thing that matters is Jesus. Mm-hmm. Well, it's the, it's the walls of religion, and it's also the the mentality, more so in my opinion, of Christians themselves, Jesus followers themselves, that got caught up in that whole denomination label, right? Sure, it's sure. it's us versus them, where it's really should be all of us. Which yeah, again I, comes back to how crafty the enemy is. Yeah, right. right. When think about Jesus's prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane when he says, "Father, make them one as we are one." Like Jesus's mm-hmm. last prayer is that we would be unified, we would be one body. Of course, Satan's going to attack that. <laughs> you know, if and he's you look, good at his job. Y'all think about this. Like even when you look at like the Muslim faith, there's basically two two versions of it, right? You're on one side or the other. The Christian right. faith, 
there's hundreds and hundreds of divisions mm-hmm. because the enemy has attacked it to make it splinter so that we're not one. So it's mm-hmm. almost like we have to do something super extreme in order to try to fulfill you know, what Jesus was praying for, that we're one. That's so good. You know, this conversation has been uh, really an eye opener, Uh, you know, thinking outside of the box, thinking outside of what traditional Christians have come to know and grown up (laughs) with. I I do know a lot of churches, especially since the pandemic, have been struggling with attendance. Um, The funny thing is, is what I'm hearing, you know, because I've seen some of the online services and stuff, um, a lot of times... What I'm hearing is the prompting from churches uh, to come back, come back to church. Um, you know, that they need to come back because of community. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I shake my head sometimes when I hear that because I think that's part of the problem is that a lot of these churches want the people to come back because they have a building for them to attend and they want to fill seats. And I don't want to sound too pessimistic or, or too um, non-spiritual, I suppose. But I think one of the problems is that they have, even pre-pandemic, lacked community. 100%. And so, and, so you yeah. try to prompt somebody to come back because you need to be part of a community. I look at that and say, well, but there was never a community, so why would I come back? And I hate <laughs> to say it, but if there's, if there's people out there that have that feeling um, something needs to change. And so what I see, sure. what you've done with King's Porch, is like, wow, this is right on, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. James, like, uh, you're going to get pushback from what you just said, but you're, sure. 100, you're 100% you you're one right. And, mm-hmm. and I'll tell you this, and I say it every time, I don't even believe that what we're doing right now is for our, our generation. I think it's I think we're setting up a blueprint and a framework for the next generation. Yes. Oh, I hope because, so. Good. Yeah. Because every every book that you read, like I read a book called The Forgot The Forgotten Ways by Alan Hirsch and he, he in the book he talks about like uh millennials and what's under that Gen Z is underneath mm-hmm. that and what there's one more it's a letter, I'm sure. Yeah, from, from millennials <laughs> down, they are leaving the church in droves right now. Right, right. And and they get a really bad rap. You know, they're they're flaky, they're noncommittal, they're they're you know whatever it is. But that's not the case. Um, no. It, millennials want three things: they want community, like you're talking about, James. They want community, Mm -hmm. they want authenticity, and they want social justice. Mm -hmm. That's the only three things. Now, our generation, our, you know, that is the older generation, we would go to church because we're good Christians and we check a box and that's what we're supposed to do. Tradition. Right? Tradition. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're good Christian, that's what you do. You go check a box. Well, millennials and under, they're not they're not box checkers. They're no, like they're not. They're like why? Why funny. are yeah. we doing this? Where right. is my money going? When I give, right. where is the money going? Because they care about social justice, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you, this non-committal thing. If you want, you want to see something. They're they're very committal. If you look at the well, last yeah. Bernie San, the last Bernie Sanders campaign was run by millennials. They mm. will die for a cause when they believe in it. Mm-hmm. They just don't it's believe true. in the church. They don't believe in the church. Right. So I'll, I'll tell you this. What we're seeing is when they show up at my house and and they can actually have community and they can know each other and they can have authenticity. But then the social justice piece is they know, oh, this week when I give money, it's going to go to pay this mom's rent. That social justice right, piece. Right. We have never once asked for money. People want to give because they know where right. the money's going. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? So oh, I really, what we're trying to do is not necessarily for our generation, but it's for when people, you know, a, the a big word that's thrown around right now is de- deconstruction. And mm-hmm. 
um, you know, it's kind of a buzzword. And when people are deconstructing Jesus, I have a problem with that and, and step in. But when people are just deconstructing their idea of what it means to look like, what, what, what the church is supposed to look like in the Bible. Yes. I'm like, yeah, I dig deeper into that. Keep studying. Right. You know, let's right. have that conversation. Mm -hmm. You talked about uh, the enemy using the tool to just make Christ followers ineffective. And I think about the scripture that talks about tradition the traditions of men make God's word ineffective. And for so long, we've hung on to the way we used to do it or the way that it has worked. It's just like you said, this generation, they don't want what has worked well, in the past. It's it's funny you say that because it's not working because because <laughs> you hear the term in church all the time. And I say in church, in the in the church building where, you know, it, whether it's a denomination or whatever else. And you hear somebody right. get up on the platform and say, let's do church. And I'm thinking to myself, you might not want to say that because that might just right. turn people off because I don't want to do church. You know, right. Exactly. Yeah. It hasn't worked. <laughs> right. You know, right. Or Well, in fairness, maybe it has worked. But it's not working now. To a certain extent. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so y'all, I, I always have to be careful and say this because I will say this, like, you know, coming from touring and being in arena after arena and, you know, passion and passion city church and Austin stone and all that stuff. Y'all God is, is moving mightily in that. And sure. I've seen him changed lives in that. And then my pendulum swung all the way over, you know, after my year <laughs> off church where I was like, okay, this is the only way to do church. And this is, you know, house church, house church, house church. And like my pendulum was over there, you know, nobody can get paid for the gospel. <laughs> you know, turns out last week we were in first Corinthians nine where Paul says, Hey, don't muzzle the ox while it's threshing. You know, right. he, he's saying it's okay for pastors to get paid. And sure. so it's like my pendulum swung way over here. And, and now I'm kind of healthily back in the middle where I just see that God is so good that he uses all of it Any. for his glory. Yep. Sure. Does. You know, I think, I think the song, I, I think we're supposed to be talking about the new record that we put out and we haven't even, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that's how, that's cool. how far down the priority it is for me. But mm -hmm. the first song on the record is called God is in this house. And and it's it's like a, it's something we can sing in our living rooms. You know, God is in yeah. this house. But I wrote that with some buddies. And one of them was Drew Bodine, who is the worship pastor at Central Live in Las Vegas. OK. And it is it's the mega church of mega churches. I mean, it's Vegas yeah. for crying out loud. You know, if you want your drummer <laughs> to spin upside down and catch on fire next week, they can make that you'll, happen. You'll see it happen. Absolutely. <laughs> you, you know, but to see that song work in my living room and then to stand in the in the sanctuary at at Central, you know, with yes. three or four thousand people and hear those people singing. God is in this house. I, I literally stood there and just wept. And mm. just like, God, God, forgive me for my arrogance about house church for crying out loud. Like <laughs> to, to see that the same truth is same truth is the same truth. God is in this house if it's in a living room and God is in this right. house. If it's a mega church, if if our focus is on Jesus, That's you it. know what? Let's break it down even more. In the New Testament, it says that our bodies are a temple. Right. So God is in this house means mm -hmm. in my body. When I'm singing that, the Holy Spirit's in my body. So mm -hmm. we can let mm -hmm. fear give way to freedom, let hurt give way to healing. You know, just I think all that to say, like my pendulum's so in the middle now where I'm <laughs> so for the church. Yeah. I What God's called us to do right now is the house church. But if you're at Lakewood and 
and your eyes are on Jesus, then he will use that for his glory. Sure enough. Because God is in that house just like he's in my house. (laughs) I think a lot of times in the past, you know, you've heard the argument where uh, people tried to define church, right? And, And so a lot of times you hear people saying, well, church is not the building, it's the people. But I think... Uh, to a certain extent, we still have this perception that church has been the people in a building, and and the perception <laughs> is that you know it works and functions a certain way, and and it's not right. necessarily wrong, right? Because some people may prefer and they get that fellowship and they get that community from a building with a pastor and you know a, a team of people that serve uh, and everything else. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we need to be looking at not defining church, but the church, because that, I yes. think, is a bigger definition. 100%. Mm-hmm. The bride of Christ, the body. Yeah. Right. 100%. And, you know, it's like we've just got to be for each other. You know, Paul mm-hmm. says, I, I, obviously, I keep quoting Corinthians because that's where we are in church right now. But. He says, Mm -hmm. I choose, I choose to preach Christ and Christ crucified. Him crucified. That's it. Meaning that we're not going to agree on everything. We're not going to agree on how we're supposed to do things. We're not going to agree on certain things. But if we can agree that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he was crucified, then we have to start being for each other. Like I'm I'm for you. You know, if you're in a mega church or if you're in a house church, I'm for you. But let, let's mm-hmm. let's just do what we can do to bring glory to God. Yes, I love it. So good. Uh, hey, James, when are we um, when are we scheduling a trip to go? To Austin, I, I love it. <laughs> I want to. I want to <laughs> hang out in the living room and and you know, okay, uh, grab a coffee and sit down and relax. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Like this is this is, you, this sounds incredible. Y'all are so <laughs> invited anytime, and I tell anybody anytime they come, y'all, it's not sexy. It, the house <laughs> church is, is not sexy. It's messy I, and dirty and. Listen. Even even like when you hear our records or see the videos, we do a once a, uh, you know, we're in house church. We're in houses three three weeks out of the month, and the last week okay. out of the month, we we give our host homes a break, you know, just to not mm, burn you okay. out. And right. we meet together at a church uh, at a church building in a sanctuary Ooh. that's down the street from oh, us, no. and and we do a worship. <laughs> we do, I know, right? <laughs> we we do a worship night, and so that's when like our you know collective gets together, and we can actually yes. play together, and and that's what you're seeing there. But on a Sunday morning, it's it's like one guy with an acoustic guitar, maybe mm-hmm. you know, or somebody that's learning how to play the piano it's not sexy yes it's not polished right it's it's not even it's not even great but mm-hmm. i love it but so jesus much. is there <laughs> jesus is there and i love it yeah. so much that yeah you know it's just it's just refreshing you know that's why if you listen to our records they actually sound different because we don't have all the big bells and whistles we don't have we don't even have electric guitar for crying out loud. You know, we, we don't have a drummer. Um, the song God is in this house, when you're listening to it, the thing that sounds like a snare drum is actually a, a guy beating on a surfboard. <laughs> nice. That's <laughs> awesome. a true story. I yeah. love so, it. That's awesome. Yeah. Jesse, I, I had no idea coming into this thing what we would be talking about. And, um, and I like that. Um, Aisha and I... Um, prefer that yeah and sometimes sometimes when we're talking with artists or musicians or people in the music industry the christian music industry sometimes we're having conversations and and it's like we're pulling teeth if you know what i mean like trying to and and we want to have conversations we don't want it to be interviews we want it to be conversations this was one of the easiest uh that aisha and i have had in a long time it was refreshing and it was it deep. It was refreshing. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. I just want to let you know that. Well, yes, I'm glad indeed. to hear you say that because I kept 
I kept inside my head going, you're talking too much. Stop no, talking. No, Stop no, talking. not at all. No, that was and and so while while we while we were having the conversation, Aisha and I are on FaceTime, uh, so we can you know motion each other like if she's got something to say or if I'm we don't interrupt each other, and uh, and there were so many times when Aisha's on the screen here, (laughs) waving her hands in the air and saying (laughs) yes 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 that sort of thing. So I just let Aisha. I need more of you in my life. (laughs) (laughs) That, that, That encouragement piece. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So thank oh, you man. so much. Um, I'm, Thanks I'm, for blessing I'm, us. This was a last minute thing for us, and I so appreciate this conversation, Jesse. Hey, yes, let's do it again. That, y'all were y'all were easy. I would love to do it again. <laughs> Absolutely, I would love to do it again. Maybe we'll catch up. Like we'll follow up like in a year or whatever, and and see how things are going, and and uh, maybe it'll be a completely different conversation. I'm and sure we it might will pop be. down. Yeah. For uh, kids' hey. porch for real. My parents are in DFW, so. Hey, that's where I was raised. You are 100% oh, wow. invited to come. <laughs> Thank you. Just tell us when. Okay. I absolutely will. Awesome. All right. Well, James, Aisha, this was a pleasure. Thank you, Jesse. Yes, Appreciate indeed. it. To be continued. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. All right. Sounds good. Soon. Bless you, Mara. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Aisha, wow! It was it was so good. Oh, it was man. so needed. Right? Yeah, I I enjoyed it so much because I, I grew up in a house church. My my folks were pastors of a house church, and when the pandemic um, happened, they went online, mm-hmm. and so and they've not been back uh, as a house church since. Like they've had a few services. Um, in houses since which, but um, but not fully. Right. And so um, to hear that and and what they're doing, man, it was it really was refreshing, and it kind of made me miss it a little bit. Yeah. You know? I'm like, man. Uh, when when this, when my wife and I were first so special. when my wife and I were first married, uh, we had good friends of ours. They're still good friends, and they lived right mm-hmm. around the corner from us. And so what we had decided to do one night a week, we were going to get together for Bible study. Sort of uh-huh. like a house church. I mean, there was no okay. singing or praise and worship or whatever. We would just get right into the word. And uh-huh. um, my buddy said to me, okay, we're going to study from this chapter and this book or whatever. And we ended up, we ended up going verse by verse, but, but each week it was only one verse because that's all we had time for because we would talk See? for 45 minutes about one verse. And I remember at one point we had, while we were meeting, we had Jehovah's Witnesses knocking on the door. And and oh, we wow. we invited them in. I should have invited them. We did, and and <laughs> awesome. And and we had a house church with the Jehovah's Witnesses because See? you know we wanted to learn about them, but we wanted them to right. learn about us. And it was just sure. it was so enlightening and so like so such good conversations. I think a yes. lot of people are are scared sometimes to have conversations right. like that. And mm-hmm. uh, and I I still reflect back on those times like it was so nice and so personable mm-hmm. and so comfortable in the sense right. you know it was deep stuff deep conversations but but also we're sitting in the living room we're not sitting mm-hmm. in a pew we're not sitting you know straight up and you know have to act a certain way or dress a certain way for church right. on a sunday morning you know right and like jesse said you know it's one thing about um the traditional uh church in the sense of being in a building um you do get to hide out yeah. a little bit. Yeah, you can sit in the back. <laughs> yeah, hide out. Right. Nobody'll notice you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But with uh, house churches and the way they did it in Acts, there's not much hiding you can do. Right. Uh, <laughs> we need to get back to Acts. Yeah. 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 Such good stuff. Well, before we go, uh, let's get some artist advice. And this week, we're going to hear from Jake Smith. All right. I would say it's the most important thing that you could do, and it's um, and it's not that important as uh, as well. <laughs> Meaning, there's days where you don't have to overthink it, and you need to go. You know, we do this 52 weeks out of the year, and it's never going to stop. And so, yeah, we're going to prepare like this is going to be the best thing, and it's the most important thing we're going to do. And then there's going to be times where we're going to remember we get to do it again next week. You know, and we're going to do it the week after that. And you could do it all through your life and all through your week. So there's times where you got to give yourself some grace when it doesn't go the way 
we thought it would. That's funny uh, because just yesterday we had a little bit of a hiccup um, in our service uh, and I was talking with one of my colleagues and she was saying how for her it felt a little bit like a circus <laughs> <laughs> at one of our services yesterday and I was just like, you know what? It is what it is yeah. and we, you know, we might have had a little bit of an off day but still, when it's all said and done, it's what God has called us to. And, and that's just your opinion, too. Like, you might have right. thought you had an off day, but for someone right. that was participating, they might have thought, wow, that was incredible. Um, right. So, so his, his last statement that Jake said was, give yourself some grace when it doesn't go the way right. you expected it to. Well, it, good. You know, um, mm-hmm. in fact, it's probably good it didn't go the way you were expecting because um, that's maybe overthinking it. Yeah, sure enough. Yeah. Good advice. Well, that is it for this week. It is time for us to go. Thoroughly enjoyed our conversation with Jesse. Make sure you check out kingsporch.com. Find out about all the things they're doing and check out their music as well. Guys, don't forget to follow us as we follow Christ, as Paul say it. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Faith Strong Today's Between the Grooves podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, would you consider sharing it with your friends, rating our podcast, or giving us some love on your socials to your amazing friends and followers will only help us reach more people. We'd also love to hear from you and share your feedback in an upcoming episode. Send your video or written message to Aisha and James on Facebook and Twitter at Between Grooves or email us anytime. Hello at faithstrongtoday.com. 